So Bobby, thanks for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was this concept of hustling hard versus hustling healthy. And talk a little bit about the culture around hustling as hard as you can, working as hard as you can, and the negative impacts of that on brain health. It's a really good question. Um, I'm glad you asked that because <clears throat> there seems to be a common trend. And I think if you hear something with enough conviction, enough mm -hmm. enthusiasm, and most importantly, enough repetition, you stop questioning the source or the relevance, more importantly, the relevance to you, and you come to accept it as a belief. That's just what is. That's right. how life occurs to you. And I think one of the drawbacks of social media, and there's a lot of benefits, but one of the drawbacks is so many people are competing for mind share and you're exposed to all of these messages subsequently and, and you're exposed to these messages when you're in a state of distraction, you're exposed to these messages when you're in a state of fatigue. So your normal filters that you have when you're in conversation, somebody says something, you evaluate, well, is that true? You don't have those same filters up. So, and, and a lot of these motivational memes are disguised as inspiration, but they reek of accusation. Hmm. So it, it, you know, the first thing is when somebody says, you should be working, well, you don't even know who I am or who's reading this. Yeah. And why would you assume that we are not? So you have to ask yourself, what's the motivation of the person writing this meme? Um, and, if, and usually a lot of people that write these memes, it's a theme with them. Like, I'm great and you suck. It's always talking about what you should be doing that you're not doing. Not that you're not only not doing enough, but you yourself are not enough. And you know, I'll, I'll take another example, something, a name that everybody knows, Gary V. Yeah. When I first started listening to Gary V, I hated him. I was like, who is this absolute <laughs> wanker? Like, why are you yelling at me? And somebody said, well, you know, you should really read his stuff and then make a decision. I thought, that's a fair enough statement. And I picked up um, one of multiple books I bought now, Crush It. Yeah. I became an instant Gary Vee fan before I was done reading the book because this is a guy who is a modern day Tom Peters. Now, for those of you who don't know who Tom Peters is, Tom Peters was a guy who worked for McKinsey and he was the champion of work and career as a form of meaning, life and self-expression and collaboration. And his, his stuff was like, look, if it's not wow, why even do it? When you pour your heart into something, a collaborative project that has meaning to multiple people, it's this shared sense of vision, that's what life is about. That's what gives you meaning. And sometimes doing excellent work is because, well, I do excellent work and someday I'll wind up in a corner office, you know, and have like my own private toilet, which is great. And I could use a special coffee machine with like five people I can't stand, but it's, it's about doing excellent work for its own sake. Because right. you got one career, one go around. I'm reading Gary Vee, I'm like, this guy really wants people to succeed. This guy truly believes that people are living what Henry David Thoreau called lives of quiet desperation and wants to shake them out of that. Right. So that's a good intention. But there are other people behind the memes that's like, why are you saying this? Are you trying to help me? Do you genuinely care about me? Do you care about this issue? Or is this just a way of saying, wow, you guys are doing so poorly over here. I guess I'm doing all right. Right. Which is insecurity. So you're saying quite a few things here. Mm -hmm. Let's back up to uh, the brain state that we're in when we're consuming things like social media, when we're consuming these messages of work harder, be successful, that could eventually cause uh, less than optimal brain health. So one of the things you touched on is that we're in a highly suggestible state when we are consuming these messages. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, not all the time, but right. at so, certain times. What is that state? What's going on in the brain when we are in that state? And why is that having that effect? So what I'm talking about here is distraction versus focused attention. So if I'm having a focused conversation with Ryan, for example, right? Which, you know, if I'm crazy enough to actually engage in that, <laughs> my brain could kind of filter what what's right and what's not right. So there's centers of the brain that act as comparison meters, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm always comparing 
what I'm hearing from what I know to be true mm -hmm. versus what I might not know to be true. So, so basically the center of the brain that would help us determine whether we're filtering that or not would be the anterior cingulate gyrus. Mm -hmm. Anterior cingulate gyrus, as you said earlier, reticular activating system, okay. what we're paying attention to. So the benefit of that is I can be more discerning what I, what I accept and what I don't accept. I can evaluate information as it's presented to me. But when I'm in a state of distraction, or I'm like multitasking, right, or I'm really exhausted, and I'm on my iPhone, like right before I go to bed, which is probably not the best time. Or right when you wake up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and we all do that. You know, I, I get yelled at by my wife, luckily. Yeah. Like, uh, even, even when I just like wake up and like go to hit off on the alarm, she's already like, are you on Facebook? No, I just woke up. I don't even know what <laughs> and, Facebook is. And regardless is. of the exposure to blue light at night, even if you're wearing, you know, blue blocker glasses to protect yourself mm -hmm. from the blue light, you're still in that highly suggestible, relatively drained in terms of attentional resources state. And we're taking in these messages in addition to when we wake up, I think there's an increase in alpha wave uh, activity in the brain, which makes us a little bit more suggestible. And so how can we regulate not just being away from our phones, but how can we have some internal mechanisms for regulating our suggestibility to those messages? I know that some of that's subliminal, mm -hmm. um, but can we kind of, is, is there a way to create a value system that's our foundation to protect ourselves from these messages? That is a beautiful question. Because one, um, here, here's something that we were at a seminar, uh, Bezos' seminar. Right, that's right. Ago, Fitness Business Summit. There was something he said from the stage that was very powerful. He said, I'm a producer of content, not a consumer of content. So before you go on Facebook, ask yourself, why am I doing this? Like, why am I here? And it could be, it could be as simple as setting aside times of the day when you do go on social media. Because a lot of people enjoy being on social media, um, and a lot of people need to be on social media for the nature of their work. Sure. So it's not like let's just get rid of social media. That right. makes you no sense. Right, you can't be exclusionary to that. Yeah, I got broke up yeah. with by a girl on the telephone when I was a kid. I didn't say, "Oh, well, I'm going to get rid of telephones." That must be the problem. <laughs> but I'm only going to be on social media from 11 to 12, right. right? Or let's say seven and eight in the morning, and five to six o'clock at night. So those are the two times that I'm going on social media. Why am I going on social media? What am I looking for? So maybe treat social media like a cocktail party. Right. I'm not here to talk to everybody because some people I really don't want to talk to. Some people I do want to talk to. I shouldn't. And I don't have time to get around to the whole room. Who are the people that I most want to meet? Who do I have the greatest point of commonality with? Assuming I'm somewhat socially awkward right. and I need that bridge of commonality. You could relate to that. Absolutely. Yeah. To cross. So now I have a specified time when I'm going on social media. I know why I'm going on social media. I know who I'm going to talk to on social media. So now I can concentrate and I can, if I'm going to read a post, what do I want to get out of this? Do I want to be dragged into a political argument? Do I want to get into a community that's totally centered around cats? Um, what am I looking for? And now when I read a post, I can ask myself, what am I getting out of this? What can I contribute back to this group? And what's right about this? What's wrong? Where do I agree? Where do I disagree? So right. utilizing questions to direct your mental focus to help you be a little bit more discerning. It's kind of like reading a book through the filter of, I'm just going to go front to back. I right. said, well, what was the book about? I don't know, but I think I enjoyed it. <laughs> Versus, here's the questions I have for an author. I'm going to highlight what's interesting. I'm going to write down questions. And I'm not going to read a book. I'm going to dialogue with a book. I love that. Talk so, about the reticular activating system. Yeah. When you don't know the answer to something, and you say, well, I'll find out. And then you go and you check it out and you come back and tell somebody, well, I looked it up and here's the answer. You get the very same or similar question three years later, you still remember it. Right. That's the power of focused attention. That's the power of a dialogue. So you were the one who taught me that because social media, a guy my age, it's not intuitive. You are like, treat it like you're just out meeting people. Well, we can have these reflective mm -hmm. questions that we can ask as a yeah. tool, uh, but Regardless of that, we might still find ourselves just mindlessly scrolling while we're on the toilet. It's just inevitable, right? And so another way we might be able to do this is look at the motor component 
of what we're doing. And what I mean by this is people with cigarette addictions, for example, are not just attracted to the cigarettes. It's not just that dopamine hit or the neurochemical hit, whatever it is. It's really the motor output associated with smoking the cigarette. That makes sense. That. Yeah, because I hate cigarettes, but yeah. I just love doing this. Yeah, you it's love weird. doing that. It's just weird. It's, <laughs> so suggestive interpretations aside, we're really looking at how can we disrupt the motor function? Let's not go there. So one one way of doing that is certainly putting your phone aside, maybe bricking your phone, or just putting it aside in a cabinet or a drawer. But sometimes if we can't do that, because we usually have our phones with us, uh, we might just say, I feel myself doing the movement. How can I disrupt the movement by either doing another movement or just stopping myself from doing the movement by asking myself a question? Not just, am I going on social media? If I am, what am I looking for? What's the result? But even just saying, why am I doing this movement and practicing that motoric impulse control? Mm -hmm. And as we get deeper into the techniques behind what we do at somatic, motoric, not moronic, but motoric. So your motor impulse, right? And so where we might experience poor motoric impulse control is like if I go for a step in one direction, but really I step in a different direction and I stumble, that's motoric impulse control or lack thereof. But we have strategies for overcoming that. Um, now let's talk about attentional resources. We talked about being suggestible. Mm-hmm. We talked about having a better value system. Or one more thing I want to bring up though. Yeah, of course. Uh, go for it. It, you know, it's really important. And I had a coaching client emailed me today and just basically say, well, you know, I'm doing these things and just it's just an extra five minutes a day. Does that count? Mm-hmm. Anywhere you start is a very good place to start. Right? You don't got to be great to get going on a certain behavior, but you got to get going if you're ever going to be great at it. Sure. So, you know, even five minutes a day gives you a platform to build with and it gives you the confidence. My, um, my wife... Uh, she basically, you know, not not to contradict all the advice you gave. Of course not. But she she, she was uh, walking and um, somebody left a cabinet open outside the building. You know where they're checking the meters? Sure, yeah. And I think she like had her head down on her phone, got hit in the head, and she smashed her phone. So <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't have a phone for about a week and she adapted to it. Now, obviously, you don't want to do that for your business, for your life. I'm not suggesting smash your phone or leave your phone at home all day. Well, I am saying there's something to be said about disciplining yourself, engaging in certain tools versus reorganizing your life and your environment around your priorities. So if you go to the gym, I'll give you a very clear example. I can walk to and from my gym. As a matter of fact, there's no other reason why I joined the gym that I joined other than proximity and convenience, right? Mm -hmm. So I know nothing is going to happen. Like the car is not going to be stolen. Nope. I could probably make it there and back. I mean, how did we get through the 80s, right? Those of you who even were alive in the 80s. I wasn't there. I know I could leave my phone at home. And when I get to a coffee shop, because there's one right on the corner of the gym, I make a stop. And that's where I'll do re- my reading. you know. And that's where I'll start to get some ideas and highlight. Now, a lot of times, I want to check my phone. But I cannot engage in that mm-hmm. because I just don't have that resource available. And then if you could do that for like an hour or two a day, you can start to do that a little bit more deliberately. It's, it, it's almost like saying, I promise at the end of my workday, I'm, I'm going to go straight to the gym versus leaving yourself a physical cue like your gym bag at the front door of your office. So you'd have to trip over it and purposely leave it there. Right. Very different. So having that physical or an environmental Mm -hmm. cue and not just think about um, being frustrated with ourselves or saying, oh, why am I looking at my phone and being mad about it that I spent so much time on my phone, but actually using it as a reward system where, hey, at the end of this one hour to two hour time period, I can look at it again. And so we're kind of hacking that dopamine loop uh, for our benefit. Yeah. And very important what Ryan just said is the self-talk. Because if every time I look at my phone, it's like, I'm an idiot. God, I'll never get this right. Yet you're probably reinforcing the same emotional states that create your need for a dopamine hit in the first place. Right. So you're not helping, you're hurting. Better response kind of would be to laugh and just go, oh, wow. Wow, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Just like I'm on autopilot right now. Yeah. And then get off autopilot and put it away. Yeah, there's, right? Hashtag, there's nothing wrong with you. Yep, exactly. Don't take yourself that seriously in the first place. Yep. 
You're, you're not an idiot. Most of you, I mean, there might be one idiot watching this, but one or two. Most yeah. of you are not idiots. You're just conditioned, just like everybody else. Exactly. And Make so, it a game. and when, when we talk about attentional resources, um, going back to that, because that was a really good point. Um, a few things on attentional resources is usually we're most suggestible or more, most prone to making these mistakes, if you will, while we've uh, drained ourselves of our attentional resources or they've just been drained from our environment or activities. So would it be a sound strategy to then say, well, if my attentional resources are, say, an 8 out of 10, but I'm still suggestible, how can I make my attentional resources a 10 out of 10? What are the, some of the things that you find yourself, uh, in terms of health practices, uh, increasing your attentional resources day to day. Or I think an easier way to think about this is when I don't do X, my attentional resources are lower. What are those things for you? Okay, there's a couple of ways to answer this. So I'm not gonna answer this in any given order. Sure. One, emotional state. When you're frustrated, when you're angry, really bad time to go on to social media. Right. One, you wanna, you wanna go on social media sometimes when you're feeling good. Because when you're feeling good, you, you've got higher levels of serotonin. Serotonin in the anterior cingulate cortex is intimately tied in with attention, right? Where attention goes, energy flows, yeah. right? Keep that in mind. Also, we talk about disciplining ourselves to do things. That's mm -hmm. another big meme. You know, work for it and you better be disciplined. Sure. But I, I, I sent out, um, I responded on someone's thread going, well, what is discipline? Mm -hmm. And they came back with a philosophical answer and it wasn't wrong. But if I'm dealing with someone with like type one diabetes, I don't need a philosophical response to why that pancreas is not producing insulin. <laughs> I want to know like what actually happens if you're talking about discipline, where does it live? Yeah. Right, because yeah. it does lit right. Because if I'm talking about like cardiorespiratory health, my cardiorespiratory system lives somewhere. Mm -hmm. Where does it live? How does it function? And to me, discipline is glucose regulated, sustained attention. That's yeah. what it is. Beautifully said. And, and I probably could say that better if I wasn't, you know, like depleted right now. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm knackered, or, or if I had a chance to revisit this, but. When you're talking about discipline, you're talking about the function of your prefrontal lobes. And if you're going to utilize it, it's not free. It costs you currency, and that currency is glucose. Right. So if or we might call it cognitive calories. Or yeah, cognitive spend. calories is a great way of saying that. Yeah. I like that a lot. So if, if, you're do, if you're going on social media when you are hungry or just after you got out of a meeting where you had to utilize a lot of glucose to stay focused, to stay off your phone, so you were disciplined, mm -hmm. not a good time. So what's your emotional state? What's your level of fatigue? And utilize questions. Always utilize, well, not always, that makes no sense. You can use, utilize questions. Utilize yeah. questions more frequently because what that does is it brings your prefrontal lobes back online. When you're just going around on autopilot and you, and you ask any question, you have to utilize your higher brain centers in order to get an answer for that question. Right. Right. So it's a very good strategy to, to direct your focus by not making statements, assumptions, and proclamations, but asking questions. A, a, a good resource for this is type into uh, Google or, or Google Scholar, uh, Ibram Sene, University of Illinois. Yeah. You'll come up with some cool research on that. Very cool. So when we're on autopilot, right, yeah. really what we're finding ourselves in is the default mode network. You've heard of this. Mm -hmm. And so when we're in the default mode network, it's that area of the brain that's usually responsible for mind wandering, daydreaming, which is extremely valuable. But typically we find ourselves as victims of the default mode network. And so there's two places in, in my research where you can go. One is the executive network and the other is the task positive network. And the executive network is this sustained attention state that we've been talking about. And we can go there by using questions, having a cue, having a task to keep our attention, planning, organization. And typically when people are trying to be productive, they're trying to be in that executive network where they're trying to do work, which is associated with executive functions like attention, planning, organization, working memory, emotional regulation. And so the executive network is the executive, the CEO of your brain. 
And so that's where people are trying to go. I think that's why people get frustrated when they catch themselves in the default mode network. They're saying, crap, I really need to be in the executive network mm -hmm. in order to accomplish my goals that my value systems align with. But we can also go to the task positive network, the TPN, which is usually activating when people are mindful. Now you don't have to just meditate. You can focus on your bodily sensations like your breath, what you're feeling on your feet, what you're taking in through your, your smell, your sight, your hearing, and that can get you out of default mode and into task positive. And so if you're in default mode and you find that frustrating and you're not aligning to your value systems or what you need to do at the time, you can either direct your attention or direct your sensation. And mm. when you kind of tweak your direction or your attention or your sensation, it can get you out of that default mode network until you're ready or you need to come back to it. And if we stay in executive network at all times, you can exhaust those cal cognitive calories and you need to restore them, usually by going to the task positive network, by doing some sort of mindfulness or sensing the environment based activity, yeah. or default mode network, which is kind of like your recovery state. Any faculty is a limited resource in the brain. Absolutely. So and it's so, a of knowing yourself. Yeah, and kind of knowing are we on, you know, this network, this network, and this network really helps. Because if people catch themselves in the default mode network, they might think that there's something psychologically wrong for them. And we know what happens with the belief system. If people believe that, that can act, those symptoms can actually manifest. And so what we want to do is use these or, networks or as a resource. Or you're engaged in activities that prove you right and away from activities that threaten you right. because of that belief system. And, and that's not mm -hmm. necessarily, um, that's, that is the reticular activated system, mm -hmm. right? And addressing, it addresses those uh, belief centers in the brain, but it's not necessarily uh, putting an intention out there and it comes true. It's not a destiny-based thing. It's really a neuroscience. Right, you're not altering uh, cosmic events by, by virtue of your thought patterns. Yeah, and people think You're that. not Franklin Richards. Right. The, the real geeks understand what I just said. The other people, what are you Who talking are you? about? Is he a professor? What school does he teach at? Um, but what was I good? A lot of people like to cite uh, Carol Dweck's research yeah. and talk about fixed mindset versus growth mindset. And, and sure. that's something that's become a buzzword. Yeah. You want to have a growth mindset. Well, yeah. What does that mean the, exactly? The way to success is just have it. Yeah, you're, you're an achiever. No, that's yeah. not what she was talking about. What she was talking about is the way people structure their belief systems based on the input they received. So Carol Dweck's research dealt with kids solving mathematical problems after receiving feedback or praise or coaching that was very different. One was around the behaviors. The other one was coaching around innate attributes. Mm. Like, wow, you really worked very hard on that, Ryan. That, sh that shows a lot of commitment, very proud of you versus you're so smart. Mm. And obviously for those of you who know the research, you know where we're going. Those of you who don't, very simply, the kids who are constantly told you're so great, you're so smart, they get screwed up big time because both of those kids were given equally challenging mathematical problems and the kids who were told how smart they were performed not only not as well, but they quit sooner because if I run into a hard problem and I can't solve it and my identity and self-worth is structured on being smart, right? well, now if I can't do this, what am I? Right. Versus if I'm praised and conditioned that it's the behavior itself that's a virtue, well, if I run into something difficult, this is a great time to exercise my virtue right. rather than having my virtue or my identity threatened, which puts me in a state of fight or flight, which is not good. Either avoiding something, right, mm -hmm. or combating it, becoming antagonistic, right. or freezing, doing nothing at all. So it, when we talk about fixed mindsets versus... Um, a growth mindset, that's exactly what we're talking about. Well, how often do people, or even us, try to seek those innate values uh, mm -hmm. to, to be reflected in us from other people, saying, oh, I want you to tell me I'm X, Y, Z, versus that I just work really hard, right? Where that's you... the worst thing, is to, it, it is to get too attached to other people's opinion or your own headlines about who you are. Right. And First there's... of all, you're not very objective in how yeah. you evaluate yourself. Neither are other people. That shit doesn't define you. What do you do based on what you love? 
that's a more powerful metric, and that's one that can't be threatened. Which is why I love Simon Sinek's work with Find Your Why, yeah. because it's what's that statement you can anchor to that then determines your behaviors and the steps you take. But it, the, the why statement's not you focus, it's focused outside of you, which is great because it's really promoting mm. the, the work and the behaviors, not necessarily the innate values. Because if we looked at apes, and we took a group of 10 apes, right? And we said, these gorillas are going to put out behaviors that either contribute to their survival as a group or do not. And if half of those apes are probably thinking, well, I'm the best, I'm the strongest, I'm the best hunter, I'm the best person at reproducing, you, whatever it is. You arrogant ape. You arrogant apes. What are you doing, right? But the, it, they're all apes, and basically they need to put out behaviors that contribute to their survival or do not. But those behaviors are a result of their work, not a result of who they are. Yeah, and and usually outwardly focused because, I mean, it, we were the weakest and slowest mammal on the African savannah, but um, that's, that's neither here nor there. Even when you're as big and strong as an ape, right. the only way you survive is by helping others. Exactly. Collaboration. Yeah. You know, I, I mean... With a less evolved brain, that doesn't work out very much. well. You're, you're better sure. off being fast or strong or some combination of both. But when you have a more highly evolved brain, one of the reasons for that is around collaboration. Yeah. You know, if I if I was like you know forty thousand years ago being attacked by a woolly mammoth, I'm not very formidable. Mm -hmm. However, if I can communicate with five of my tribes people, confuse that woolly mammoth, or get it to avoid me and go over a cliff. Right. I'm extremely formidable. So and I'm thinking about Robert Sapolsky's. Have, have you ever um, come across any information from Robert Sapolsky about his work and his observation of baboon troops? Sure, yeah. And it, fun, do we have time for a funny story? Yeah. We well, do. it's not funny. It's actually tragic, but I'm twisted. So they were studying, because this, this comes back to the whole work for it versus, you know, exhortation, accusation versus contribution. So they were studying alpha males versus beta males in this baboon troop. And what they found was that the betas had a much higher incidence of what we would call stress-related and lifestyle-related illnesses. Mm. And you would because you're always afraid. You're always subjugated. You um, have probably have less opportunity to mate. Right. So all of the all of the, the the struggles that you find in modern human life, very similar struggles were found here. But something very interesting happened. <laughs> there was a a group of tourists who were told that where they were staying, don't leave any food out and don't leave it behind mm -hmm. for your own safety and also for maintenance of the ecology. Now, if you've worked out in the gym business, you know, long enough, you know what people are told they should do is not always what they actually do. Common sense versus common practice. Yes, yeah, like yeah. people leave their weights out when they know they really shouldn't. The people left their food behind and, well, the food got tainted. And the baboon troop stumbled across it. It's like free food. Wow, it's like Christmas, like yeah. it came early this year. But here's the problem. Only the alphas which not a true sense of the, of the term alpha, but that's a whole different story, got to eat first because they were in charge and nobody challenged them. Unfortunately for them, the food was so tainted, they all died. Wow. So now you had a baboon the whole troop, whole, all the alphas dead. So now you have females and beta males together. Mm. Well, what's going to happen to this troop. Well, what they found is when they retested all of the, when they took the blood work of all of these uh, beta baboons, they had better health markers. And when followed long term, they were more healthy in the absence of the alphas than the alphas were in comparison to them. And in every single category the tribe or the troop, not the tribe, flourished because here you had the alphas subjugating the tribe. Now everybody was like, these they were nice guys yeah. for the most part, and they were helping the women. And the women, the, the females, in turn, were helping the beta males, right. and they all worked together. And in every sense of the word, the tribe flourished, and mm -hmm. and all of the 
Could you call the baboons into all the baboons inside that tribe did better in comparison? So what does that mean for us? What it means for us is I, I think an outward focus, what started me on this tangent is you talked about outward focus. Mm -hmm. And we're so conditioned that when you're doing without, look within. Uh, one of the best CEOs I've ever worked with, or at least one of the one that I respected a lot, talked about the concept of originating intention. And what makes an originating intention powerful, this is something I always truly believed, mm -hmm. but he kind of gave a succinct phrase to it, is it starts with the word you, and it's focused outward on somebody else and what you want to contribute, mm -hmm. which I think is a great litmus test for how you direct your attention yeah. daily. Because sure. you don't have to tell a great dad or a great mom to focus on their kid. Like I, I was reading an article where um, somebody had advised, it, just so you don't leave your kid in the back seat of your car, leave something valuable back there as well. Right. Like your phone. Like your phone, something valuable versus your kid, your living, breathing. What, are you, what is a society mental? But you don't have to tell good parents that. Right. Because they're not going to leave their kid in the back of a hot car because they value the kid over the phone. You're not going to tell them, well, you got to feed your kid. They're going to feed the kid. If you ever took a look at it, like their whole life revolves around that kid. Mm -hmm. Why? Because of the meaning that kid represents and the outward focus. Right. You know, so they're not yep. going, hey, you know what? I'm going to work on my ability to be a better parent. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Meanwhile, you're neglecting your kid. It's, it, it's all of those attributes that make great parenting. They don't show up perfectly, but they show up automatically mm -hmm. as a result of having the intention of loving that kid and wanting to do what's best for that kid. Sure. So an outward versus an inward focus a lot of times, one, it alleviates all of the emotional states that impair focus mm -hmm. and that impair performance. I can't be 100% focused on coaching Ryan and Ryan is the center of my attention in the moment and still be self-conscious, still feel anxiety, right? Still feel anger, still feel depressed. I can't feel all of that in this moment to the same degree if I'm outwardly focused right now. Right. And so the way we can apply this is, is many ways. Mm -hmm. um, to go back to the baboon alpha male study, right? If we are concerned with being the alpha male, that's probably not healthy. And it kind of brings us full circle to the hustle healthy versus hustle hard, right? Where everyone's trying to be the alpha male in whatever space it is. And that's vitally important to them. But according to that study, it's not necessarily healthy to do that. In addition, mm -hmm. we want to focus out. And so... Oftentimes we, we want to focus out on others and that's a great leadership strategy, but as a health strategy, what if we were to take our components of ourselves, like our health, and say, if my health was my baby, I would focus out on my health and refer to my health as almost like this, not to make it uh, artificially schizophrenic, but say, this health is my baby, I'm going to focus out on my health. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's a good mental strategy to reframe our efforts towards the things that matter. And so if we identify the top three things that matter, yep. let's say our health, mm -hmm. uh, our support system, both a combination of family, work, and friends, yep. and maybe um, our higher purpose, which is usually focused on other people, maybe your why statement, and we have three babies now and we're focusing out on those babies daily, that would be one, a great way to focus our attention to eliminate distractions because we're focusing our, our attention, and three, be able to be healthy in alignment to our value system and therefore be happier. Is that a fair way to lay that out? That's a beautiful way to lay it out. Um, one of my very best friends in the world, uh, he just lost his dad mm -hmm. um, over the past couple of days. And one of the things you know, he was saying about is, I met his dad, what a lovely guy. And one of the things that he was, he was saying is that his dad gave him unconditional love. Hmm. And his dad was his hero. And you know, his, his dad, again, didn't set out and say, I'm going to be the world's greatest dad. Because not a good strategy for anything because you're likely to develop blind spots if it's all about you versus the object of how you live out your values. Hmm. And he said he, he, his dad was a hero because he sacrificed so much because he wanted his kids to take risks and have that security financially and emotionally to know, 
Okay, you, you always have the love of your family to fall back on because what he valued was people taking risks. What right. he valued was adventure, you know, exploration. And, and it's funny how you know, his, his son has a lot of that. And he said, man, if I, if I don't use my life to my fullest ability, shame on me mm. for taking all my dad's sacrifices in vain. I think, you know, we talk about behaviors usually line up with values. Yeah. If you look at how someone behaves, see, I hate that shit where, well, it, it, behaviors reflect like character and you lack this and people are not broken. I don't hold that perspective. There's nothing wrong with you. Yeah. There is nothing wrong with you. You just might have a value system mm -hmm. that you don't think you should have mm -hmm. because somebody told you that's not okay. Right. You want to be like us. You know, and most people, mm, I don't know, I heard in a seminar once, take a look at what 99% of the people in the world are doing, do the opposite, because mm. you don't want to go in that direction. Not saying 99% of the people are wrong or in the wrong direction, but are they living true to themselves? If you want to know what you value, ask yourself, okay, if you won the lottery and like hundreds of millions, mm -hmm. and time and money were no longer a factor in your life, what would you do with your time? What would you learn, right? Mm -hmm. uh, who would you hang out with? Who would you never see again? And that starts to reflect a lot of your values. You know, like, like you know, Ryan talked about family being a value or mm -hmm. health being a value. That's an environmental construct that allows you to live your values. Here's what I mean. People say, well, I value my family. And a lot of times I'll say to audiences, no, you don't. And people will look at me like, like I, I just said that their religion was false. Yeah. Understand what I mean. Especially if you're someone who said, well, I want to have a family one day, and then you had a family. The value was there in the first place. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, you wouldn't have wanted that family. Right. You might value love, right? Or you might value, like my friend's dad, freedom yeah. and exploration. And you want to help this kid. You have an environment where you can now teach that and you can now give that. And if love's your highest value, you can create that within a network. And so the family in that example becomes the vessel for the Yes, family. exactly. Okay. That is the medium by which you exercise your values. So, so typically people are surrounded by these. You're already surrounded by family in some mm -hmm. context, right? Or a support system, friends, yep. a work environment. That everyone has one of those, right? And typically people are in this physical vessel, so they have their health or they have a vessel that they can focus on. And then people have their mental vessel, the brain-based vessel where they can focus on their beliefs, their work, their mental outputs, their mental inputs. And so what are three easy steps people can take to find the values that occupy any of those vessels? Uh, okay, so what you're asking is, how do you take a look at the things that you're doing in your life, sure. your family work, sure, yeah, and say what are the values that go into each that drive me? Yeah. Okay, here, really good question. Not an easy one, mm -hmm. but a really important one. When you're in your day to day stuff, I'm just going to take one. All right, um, because to to evaluate three would be harder. Let's say work. Is that sure. fair? Yeah, work is fair. What activities in your work day? Do you have to discipline yourself to do mm -hmm. and push yourself to do would be a better word versus which ones pull you into them by the sheer nature of how you feel? That's number one. Number two, what are the areas, uh, this goes back to Dr. Viktor Frankl and logotherapy, yeah. what are the areas in your life where you take something that other people find hard to learn and you learn it relatively easily compared to other people you know. Mm. Um, where, are your, where are your greatest areas of competence and where's your greatest areas of interest? Mm. And then look at the other side of that. What are things that you have to push yourself to do? What are activities where it's the hardest for you to maintain focus and attention most of the time? Does the same things constantly come up? Right. 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 Um, when, when you... When you stay late at the office, right, or wake up early mm -hmm. and you're excited about that, what are those activities and what, what do those have in common? What do they represent, mm -hmm. if you will? What do they okay. represent? But yeah, be better way of saying that because a lot of times our interest and our enjoyment and our ability 
to get really good at something is rooted in what we value. Got it. Yeah. You know, that, that, and, and we learn this. We, we, we kind of know this when we're a kid. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the great example, typical example is the guy who grows up to be an attorney. Right. But when he was in school, he couldn't stop himself from picking up instruments, mm-hmm. you know, and his dad, maybe when he was in law school, said, well, you need to study harder. Yeah. And he had to force himself to study where he'd be up all night till like 12, one in the morning trying to practice on an instrument. Right. What will, is the person lazy? That's why he's not studying the law. Not how, at all. Could, how could you be so lazy at law, but practicing music, you're so committed. And a lot of people are tempted to say, well, cause music's easy. Really? <laughs> it's pretty it hard, goes yeah. through the same, you have to go through the same hard, intense, rigor and push past fatigue, notice mistakes, go back, deliberately correct them, they're equally as hard. That deep practice necessary for exactly. any Exactly. Yeah. Deep practice necessary for the myelinization mm-hmm. that allows you to develop capacity or skill. Achieve mastery, if you will. Ex- yes. And other people are like, well, the music was enjoyable. Why is that wrong? It's almost like, well, if you love what you do, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> no, if you love what you do, you'll have that mental reserve and it's, to it's push yourself. more energy efficient to uh-huh. do what you love, right? And that's a great way to Much maximize more. attentional resources, maximize the cognitive calories you're spending, and really kind of remove any of those mental, psychological, or even cognitive disruptors that people get because they're not enacting in terms of their value system or along their values. Mm-hmm. And I think that's wonderful because a lot of people wonder why they're foggy, fatigued, anxious, depressed. Typically, it's not. It's because they're not enacting their value system or along with their value system. I think this is a great mental tool for people to have mm-hmm. that they can kind of answer the, their own questions in this step by step format to kind of achieve that as a as a mental health and a cognitive health tool. So that's great. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Ryan.